Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always. And today we are joined by Paolo Bortolin, MBA and Deputy CFO at the city of Lugano in Switzerland. Paolo is a pivotal member of Lugano's Plan B for Bitcoin, plus the city's blockchain and crypto task force. With a passion for Web3 blockchain, smart contracts, fintech, Bitcoin, and cryptocurrencies, Paolo envisions a future where these technologies revolutionize treasury, banking, and public sector operations. His extensive career includes roles as Deputy CFO, Vice Director of Finance, Board Member, and FinTech Advisor. Fluent in English, French, Italian, with knowledge of German and some Spanish, Paolo is a global financial strategist and an enthusiastic speaker at international crypto and blockchain events. I've asked him to join us here today to share his story and tell us about his work in helping the city of Lugano embrace cryptocurrency by accepting Bitcoin and USDT with no limits on amounts or services, meaning citizens can pay all their bills with this modern tech. This incredible breakthrough positions him at the forefront of digital finance innovation, making him an authority to discuss the future of crypto and commerce. Paolo, thank you so much for joining us, my friend. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you. Good morning, Dario. Thanks for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here. Yeah, we had a good pre, pre-call talk. I'm excited to hear about this as well. But before we even get into this topic, <laughs> I always like to ask, how did you even get into finance? Is this were your parents in the industry? Is this like a, a family kind of business? Being or do you all sit around like 17? I know uh, one of our guests, he comes from a line of 17 clinical psychologists. I can only imagine what holidays would be like at their house. But is that your story too? Everyone have some sort of financial background? No, absolutely not. That was all my, let's say, my ideas, my interests. Since I was basically a kid, I was 11, 12 years old. I had two passions, numbers and money, counting money. When I was a kid, I was all the time counting my cents in my piggy bank. And also IT, let's say technology. I'm a passionate of computers since 81, 82. So at the very beginning of the computer life, and not on the 70s, but on the 80s, I was programming the famous Commodore 64 or ZX Spectrum. That was another home PCs. At that time, we didn't even have PCs at home or in the offices. So that was really some revolutionary. And I didn't know why, but I really liked this instrument immediately. And actually, there's a story behind this. I asked my father to, to, if I could borrow 600 francs, which is more or less $600 today. And he said, for what? It's a lot of money at that time. He said, I was 11 or 12 years old. I said, I want to buy a computer. And I said, what the hell is a computer? And my answer was, I don't know, but I know I need one. That was really the real answer. I still remember that. And then I started programming in basic and I got passionate by technology. To make it short, then technology and finance always, let's say, is part of my life since always. Then I went to the university to study finance. Then I MBA at UC Berkeley. So I really always kept these two components, technology and finance. And today is nice because they in this fintech. Mm-hmm. But at that time, I was a strange guy with two passions, IT and finance, which they never talked together before. So that's a little bit the story. But no one in my family was involved either in, neither in, in finance or in a computer. That was all my interests. So can you walk us through some of your, like the stages of your career? An MBA, obviously that's business, but you're working in the public sector now. Yeah, it's it's a very, yeah. It's a very diversified uh, career. I always follow my interests and I always done jobs or taken jobs which interest me, where I have something to do with innovation, where I can innovate, where I can change things. So let's start from the beginning. My father has a couple of small, medium companies around 40, 50 employees. And when a family, generally speaking, in the Italian culture, the family has a company, it's normal that the the sons and the daughters, they go inside of the company and they continue this. So what I've done is I started accounting at high school. It was a high school with accounting component. So I was the accountant of the family. Naturally, I say finance. At the beginning, you start from the accounting. So I become the accounting of my family, one of my family business, very small, 15. This was 15 employees, but still very interesting because I was doing the accounting manually with papers at that time. Right. And I introduced in 87, the first computer, the first software, and I changed completely the structure of the company. So I can tell you some stories about 
always this component and uh, finance. Then after a year, I said, okay, accounting is nice, but I want to do more. <clears throat> I had a couple of friends of mine who went to the university. So after two years, I left the company and I went to the university in Fribourg, in the French side of Switzerland, because as Switzerland has four official languages. So I'm Italian speaking, basically, so you can really hear from my accent, it's a really Italian accent. But in Switzerland, we speak German, French, Italian, and Romance, which is a, a very interesting language between German and Latin. Yeah. It's a very interesting language. It's a minority, but we try to care, take care of this language too. So I left there, I started finance at the university, then came back to the family uh, business again, developed the business, and three years later, uh, I left the company again to go to UC Berkeley uh, for doing my MBA. Great experience, amazing experience, not only for the MBA, but living in the US, another culture, another language, another system, completely different. I learned so much. And then, to be honest, the, the Bay Area, Stanford, uh, UC Berkeley, and the Silicon Valley is really something amazing. So I learned a lot about innovations, more and more about innovation, and I got passionate about the internet. Then when I came back from, from this, I still taking care about uh, one of the two family businesses. And then seven years later, I decided to leave. So I sold uh, my stake to my brother, which I was working with my brother at that time. And that's also a very interesting story. I decided to finally go for the banking sector. So finance, I want to go really for finance. But that was the end of 2007. So it's probably the worst timing ever to choose to go into banking, right? <laughs> I was doing some interviews with some big private banks. They said, okay, you are okay. We we'll probably give you in January, next January, which was 2008, the contract, so the, the job, but they never called back. And then in, in February, I really realized what was going on because the crisis, the financial crisis started in February, 2008. And I realized why they never called back. And that was a chance because if they had hired me, probably six months later, I was home again. <laughs> so what I, I did at this point with a friend from Guatemala, we decided to start an internet startup and we did it. But clearly in the middle of the financial crisis, not the best time to do that. Anyway, that was a great experience. We built that a platform. Uh, I work with programmers. Once again, this IT company is coming up. Three years later, the, the startup was okay, but not taking off. So we decided to sell the company. Mm -hmm. And I decided to try to go back to the financial sector. But still, 2010, 11 was still bad for the financial sector. But I got the opportunity to be hired as treasurer of the state of Canton of Ticino. Canton of Ticino is the, the region where, uh, where Lugano is located, so southern Switzerland. And as you probably know, Switzerland is a confederation of states. We have 26 cantons, which are also states, like the U.S. model, right? And uh, I was the treasurer. I became the treasurer of this state. And uh, very interesting because I could apply the financial concept in, in a strong way because the canton has $4 billion budget and $2.5 in debt. So I said, okay, that's a big number to apply the financial principles. And they could really change the strategy of the treasury, change the strategy of the financial <laughs> investment of, of the canton. And that was a great success. I'm, I've done... So very interesting stuff, including making the first official rating of the state uh, with Moody's. So I introduced the, the Moody's rating. And what is what are the chances that you can make a rating of a state for the first time? That's really something for mm -hmm. financial guys. Very interesting. Then in 2019, I left and I became the head of retail banking of Southern Switzerland of Postfinance, which is one of the biggest banks here in, in Switzerland. And three years later, I left and I came to Lugano as deputy CFO and member of this blockchain and crypto task force. So I finally got all at the same time, finance, big budgets, big money, and the crypto and the blockchain. Right. To be honest, yeah. And in the crypto space since 2016 for personal interest, even though I was working for the state and for the bank. And I helped to start uh, to uh, set up a startup in Milan. Milan is also very active for blockchain and crypto startups. And I helped them to, yeah, I was part of this uh, first round of founder of a startup. So as you see, I have the startup side, the small, medium company side, the banking and the state side. So I'm very broad, uh, broad yeah, interest uh, profile. Yeah, that's part of why I think you're a great person to come and, and talk about this. Now, can you... Having gone through your experience and seen both sides, what would be, if you had any advice for people either starting a business or struggling with their business? Ah, that's a big question. 
first of all, I, I will say to everyone, follow your passions. If you have a passion or you have, let's say, some, something is strong that you can really do well, so try to develop this and, and go ahead on this. Because if you have the passion, you have the interest, then when all the problems comes, all the big mountains comes against you, they block and they don't allow you to go ahead. If you have the passion, you can really go ahead. You can find solutions. You can work harder because it's part of the passion. The very general advice I give to everybody, if you want to start a company or if you go to a job somewhere for a big company, work with passion. And if you don't like what you do, change, do something else. Really, maybe completely different. As you see, my profile is very, let's say, out of the box. I started from a company manager, then startups, then left for MBA, then back a banking, then a state. So people right. don't understand how you can pass from a from a startup internet to a, a state, so a public administration, which is two different cultures. Right. Just be very courteous and go ahead with your passion. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's important what you say because you're, by pursuing your passion, you have unique experiences which develop unique specializations. And that's really important because although there's universities and training centers, if, if, if there's an institution that can produce people who do what you do, your job is a commodity. Exactly. Yeah. It's through unique specializations that you have any sort of protection against that. And that's also where I, I always tell some of my listeners that there's the income earning ladder as well. At the bottom are generalists and the people who make more than generalists, like a, take a dentist, the dentist earns whatever a dentist can make. And above them is a specialist, maybe like an orthodontist. And what you're paying for is like some more sophisticated surgery. The dentist might be able to figure out the surgery but you don't want to be the guinea pig. So the order of the dentist is there and you pay a premium because they've already done the practice to solve that more advanced problem. <clears throat> so the specialist makes more than a generalist. And then the people who make more than the specialists are the trainers of specialists. And they make more because two reasons. One, they, they teach people how to become a specialist that elevates them to a certain status. It's also another income stream, you could say. But more, there's all, I, th I believe, a higher degree of certainty and outcome. When you hire a trainer of specialists, you may not get best in class, but you should get at least industry standard. They're a trainer for crying out loud. So there's the generalists, the specialists, the trainers of specialists. And at the top of the ladder, the people who make more than anybody else are the celebrities because of the laws of supply and demand. They auction off their time when it gets bid up by because there's so many bidders. I think that's really profound advice when in hindsight, it'll all make sense. But going forward, it might look really scary. But you might not know where that next pebble is going to be that you jump on as you cross the lake, so to speak. Yes. And yeah. Every time I have made a, a blind jump in my career, and every time was a blind jump, every time you bring your experience from the previous experiences, and in one way or the other, you can use it, apply it. And it, the, the life is learning, right? It's a learning process, and it's true. And you don't have to forget what you have done before, even though it's another sector, at one point, your experience in the contact with the people, in managing the people, or in taking decisions, somewhere you can put all together and it makes sense. So that's very, and make different experiences. Don't be stuck in just one thing. Try to make more experience, also inside of your job. So be curious and try to, to be involved in other projects, et cetera, because this brings you new ideas. So what... What got you into crypto? Like, why crypto? You could apply your knowledge in a lot of different ways. Why did you have the faith and the interest in crypto? I got into crypto thanks to a friend who is living in, in, in Dubai right now. He's an Italian guy, very good friend of mine. He's a specialist in digital payments since, since 2000 something. I met him in this internet startup project. He was working for the bank. He actually set up the payment system for the bank. I choose for my internet startup. And that was 2008. So back there, he was already a specialist there. Now he's a very specialist in everything is banking payments, etc. And I remember in 2013, he sent me a, a, an article about Bitcoin or 12, it was 12, about Bitcoin. Say, you have to read this. I say, okay, interesting. But at that time I had Many other things to think about. I could not really. Just my wife just gave me another big gift, <laughs> my fourth fourth girl. Yes, so love it. I say, I said, okay, yeah, I don't have time to take a care about this. It's there. It's in my mind. Then in 2014, uh, when I I set up all hey, what I had to set up, he came back and say, you really have to learn about this. You say, yeah, okay, but okay. I, I downloaded a book from Amazon that was. 
10 p.m. in my bed. My wife was not there, was away. So I said, okay, I download the book from Amazon and I start reading about blockchain and crypto. And 3 a.m. I was still reading the book and I wrote a message to my friend. I say, damn, that's amazing. It's even more than what I was expecting. Bitcoin at that time was Bitcoin, but blockchain, nobody was talking about this. I say, we can do a lot of things with this. It's amazing. I say, you should not have done me this. You should not have asked me to read this because it's just powerful. So starting from this day, I never stopped to think about blockchain. And that was 14. Then in uh, 17, we started with these friends from Milan to set up a company, etc. So that's why I got into blockchain and crypto. But honestly, it was a normal path. You start with computers in the 80s, internet in the middle of 90s, blockchain was there, now AI. I start also reading some stuff about quantum computing uh, because this is another revolution coming up. Honestly, it's really difficult to understand how really it works uh, because I really like technology from the technical point of view, how it works. Bitcoin, for instance, I'm not interested about the speculation on Bitcoin to make millions. I'm not interested about that. I'm interested how Bitcoin works. And it's just amazing how it works. It's, it's genius. It deserves the, the Nobel Prize of economy. It's just amazing. So quantum computer is something fascinating me, trying to understand from the technical point of view. But guys, that's really tough. Understanding all this yeah. physics of the quantum physics. Okay. It will take maybe 20 years to understand the basics. Actually, the, the godfather of quantum computing is David Deutsch. And he's written a series of books. One of them is the beginning of infinity. It's a fantastic read, but it's not its not necessarily an easy read. It's a book you read and then you come back to it and you read it again. And the first time you skimmed it and the second time you read it deeper and the third time. And by the fourth time you're reading the book, you're like, oh, okay, I'm starting to get it now. I think, yeah. I'm getting some points, yeah. <laughs> it's really, for me, it was a really powerful book to read in terms of helping me discern good science between bad science, understanding how... Because before you're like, oh, we just went through three years of everyone saying trust the science. But there's a lot of people that go through the motions of science, but it doesn't mean they're doing good science. And you can lie with statistics. And so this book, for me, part of it was explaining how do you avoid that sort of conundrum, so to speak. Uh, and he talks about quantum computing and that essentially that when you're doing calculations in quantum compu computing, it's different than with a normal computer. And it says that with quantum computing, if you think in terms of almost like the multiverse, all the possibilities that could happen do happen, and they live out their lives until they all inevitably collapse into one, actually, is what you're trying to have quantum computing do. And that's versus a linear two plus two equals four. All these things are happening at cascading at the same time. Again, like you say, it, it is tough. How would you explain blockchain to a five-year-old? Oh, how do I do this? It's very... I was in, in Malta on the, I think it was the 1st November, 2017 for the first big forum there about blockchain and crypto. And there was a lot of stands there and there was a family with a, a little child. She was probably seven. And this family was there to sell their book and the book was named The Block Train. So it was a train with the wagons and they tried to explain the blockchain through a block train. And it's exactly what they will do. It's a train and you add a wagon every time and you cannot take the wagon out without breaking the train. And if the train is broken, then you cannot drive the, the train anymore. So I would say it's a train with wagons where you can put some information in each wagon and each information on the wagon depends on the information of the wagon, the wagon before. So I will try to explain this, but it's very difficult. And no, I think it's a great more or less the way I would I will use this example, which is not mine. I'm, I'm you know, yeah, stealing yeah, yeah. from them. But it was genius. So a blockchain is essentially a train with many wagons. Every time you do something, a new wagon is added, but it depends on the wagon in front of it. And there's no way to fudge. There's no way to cheat that. Because exactly. in a train example, it's in moving. And I think the blockchain, what happens is that even if someone does try to figure out a way to sneak their wagon into the mix, the when it stops, when the it's almost very democratic. When the majority of the wagons out there don't match up with this wagon, the default is to choose the one that has the longest chain, the oldest. It's like the oldest tree in the forest is the one that we go by so to speak. And everybody gets a copy of it all, uh, of all the data at the same time. Exactly. I love that. I love that a lot. <laughs> so blockchain is more use, is useful than more than just digital payments? Say it again, what do you mean? 
because you said you use blockchain at the same time that you were learning about Bitcoin. So not everybody listening is fully versed in this in these fields. So I'm saying is blockchain something that only really applies to digital payments? Oh, no. I think thanks to Bitcoin, we just realized that the technology was really useful for us because I think blockchain uh, is born on the 80s or 90s. I think actually somebody from, I, I met the professor who, conceptualize the blockchain, probably from Bay Area, if I don't remember, from San Francisco. But anyway, blockchain is a very old concept, but nobody applied this before. So Bitcoin came up with this concept of how to use blockchain. Is not Bitcoin is not only blockchain, and Bitcoin is not blockchain. So it's, Bitcoin is a concept, and blockchain is just on, on the behind, which allows the system to work. But thanks to the digital currencies, to, to the cryptos, we realized that this blockchain can work very well, which is secure, is transparent, you can violate, it, it brings a lot of advantages. So digital currency is the way we realize that blockchain is useful, but blockchain is not only uh, digital currencies. Sure, many say that it can't exist a blockchain without its native token. That's a philosophical concept, probably the native tokens on the blockchains are useful to help these transactions and to reward the transactions. But I think in 10 years, probably this is, will, won't be a, a, a topic anymore. Blockchain is blockchain. It can be the, the, the concept of decentralized blockchain is fantastic, but also centralized blockchains are not bad. Uh, maybe there is not in the philosophy of this independence, et cetera, but it allows you to open up some information to, to, the, to the external world without having too many firewalls or database checks, et cetera, because with the blockchain, you can set up public and then be sure that nobody is violating it. If you make a, a database public, then it can be tricky. Exactly. For instance, as city of Lugano, we have our own blockchain. We set up our own blockchain, 3achain.org. And we are using this for our uh, net, for our token. You, you probably will mention this later on, but Lugano has, probably the first or one of the first stable coin of a city working perfectly in a city. We have a lot of users, a lot of shops accepting it. And this is based on our own blockchain, which is a proof of authority blockchain. So it's our private blockchain open to the public, but it's private, it's not decentralized. We have 30 nodes, which are Swiss telecoms, universities, big companies, uh, big partners that work with us. Sure, it's not decentralized, it's not the real idea of Bitcoin, but it allows us to have a stable coin and implement kind of circular economy inside of the city. With a normal database, we could do it, yes, but probably security side, et cetera, building up the technology, it would be a little bit more difficult. And with a, a, a digital wallet and a crypto, very easy. So today this is very mature and, and it's very easy to read. So. Yeah, blockchain is not only crypto, you can do logistics, you can do many things. And can we talk about the founding thought? Because I know Bitcoin is about a decentralized payment system that eliminates the need for a middleman. So two people can transact together without having to pay a bunch of fees for someone. And also that there's a finite amount of Bitcoin. So there's no way to print more money because you talked about coming into the banking industry during a bit of the debt-based fiat system issues that's a recurring issue and it's uh, at the time of this recording a lot of people feel that it is a cyclical issue and one of those cyclical issues that it gets a bit bigger and bigger every time the cycle comes around so can you speak to that a little bit again for people that don't know that idea that spark behind bitcoin yes Sure. I, I'm a former bank banker executive, right? So I should defend the banks, et cetera, but no, definitely not. I really love the banking system. I really love finance and how the financial international financial market works is really still a passion to me, but how the banks behave, I think we have a big problem around the world. And 2008 just showed up all the very bad things that the banking system can do. And they deserve to be punished for that. If I remember well, for the crisis of 2008, they didn't arrest one person, right? Probably one, but he didn't have nothing to do with that. So this is really strange to me and very bad. Then you get into politics and systems and right. lobbies, but I don't want to go to, into this discussion. So Bitcoin is born as an answer to this crisis, right? It was born in 2008, nine because of this and saying banks, you are doing very bad things. You do just your business and you are destroying the, the economy. Uh, we invent something that 
will take your place. It's basically the, the idea behind Bitcoin to substitute the financial sector, the banking system with an independent way to exchange value between people peer to peer. And it's true, Bitcoin is working like that. Maybe slow because we take nine minutes to make a block, etc. Right. but it's working perfectly. Nobody never ever violated it. Right. And it's working without any consensus between me and you. It's just amazing, the system, the idea behind this. Is it one person? Is it many person? I believe it should be some very intelligent people behind this. Cyberpunks probably, but very intelligent cyberpunks. But because it has it's drawbacks. It's not a panacea because you just mentioned it takes nine minutes to make a block and it's not designed for scale. It's not designed to handle all the transactions. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, today I, I will compare Bitcoin to gold in the financial system. It will be a store of value, it will be dedicated to some part of the financial sector, but Bitcoin just started a real revolution. It just changed the way I think and I hope it's going to change the way also the banking sector they are. It's actually one of the one of the responsibilities I have inside of Lugano's plan B, which is our plan to implement this, is to talk to the banking sector and tell them what we are doing, tell them what Bitcoin is, etc. They know, but I know still telling them once more time and try to create a bridge between the traditional finance and the fintech world. So to to push them towards the innovation of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency. Why? Because Lugano is the third financial hub of Switzerland. So and we are, if we lose the banks, we lose taxes, we lose jobs, etc. So we are stimulating them. We are one off. There are many that try to stimulate the banks, including the banks itself, stimulating themselves. But we are really talking to them, say, hey, be careful, because with the concept of Bitcoin, we can, we as citizens, we can cut you out for, from the process. So right. this intermediation, it happened, it's happening. And I will bring you an example of, of the digital bond I issued last year, which was an historical bond. That's a very interesting example of potential disintermediation and, and eliminating the banks in this process. So Bitcoin is really amazing. It will last forever. I think it's here to stay. I remember all the discussion behind in 2015, 16, 17, oh, Bitcoin is gonna die, it's nothing, it's a scam, blah, blah, blah. I think it's not. Today is here and the bank sector now is investing there. Uh, SEC just approved, you're right, the, 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 the first uh, ETF, right? Yeah, that's right, for Bitcoin, that's right. And, and this means only one thing. When, the, when the, financial, the traditional financial sector start putting their hands on an asset like this, it means a lot of business is coming, right, guys? Right. So probably they won't understand the real philosophy behind this, but they are integrating this. So it's okay because it's accepted now. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit what I would say. Bitcoin is really a philosophy. It will stay as a system and then be around this other cryptocurrency will come up. The CBDCs, for instance, central bank digital currencies. So central banks are working on creating the digital dollar, uh, the, the crypto dollar, because digital dollars already exist, or the crypto dollar, the crypto Swiss franc, the crypto euro, because the technology is just fantastic. It allows you really to pay in two seconds. I can send money to my friend in Guatemala. If I'm using the banking system, it takes days right. and a and lot of money. On top of that. So yeah. this Can one you... work, this one <laughs> happened with Bitcoin because the, how Bitcoin is structured, it takes too much time, et cetera. So Bitcoin will be on the top of all this, but then a lot of system will just show up uh, like stable coins, right. USDT, USDC, et cetera that really allows to build new financial infrastructure. And the banks have to be careful because if they are not part of this, they will just be cut out. And so Very simply. I want to hit on these two things. I want to hit on stable coins and the digital bond. First, can you maybe quickly define what is a stable coin and why is something not a stable coin? A stable coin is a cryptocurrency which is pegged to a, a fiat money. I think you say fiat money in English. Let's say a normal currency, a US dollar, Swiss francs and euro, for instance. It's a kind of digitalizing the normal currencies. It's pegged many times one to one. So if I have, let's take the example of Tether, which is the biggest stable coin in the world. I think there are 97 billion right now of stable coin around the world. It's just amazing. <clears throat> and it means that one Tether is one USDT, uh, one US dollar. This allows you to buy and sell crypto. So buy a crypto that maybe is not 
let's say, available against fiat money, you can use the Tether because it's a crypto. So it accelerated the crypto adoption. Mm -hmm. But it's basically this stablecoin. You deposit $1, they give you one USDT, which is a stablecoin, and then it's a digital dollar. That's very simple. Bitcoin is not like that. Bitcoin has an intrinsic value. Its value is not pegged to anything. So that's a very big difference between Bitcoin and a stablecoin. And a stablecoin is a private coin. It's managed by a company, Tether Limited. So you give the money to somebody, they will give you a digital dollar. And they grant you that when you want your dollar back, you can ask them and get it back. We sent the rules. Naturally, there are rules on that. Somebody explained that to me. They said it was almost like a way of a company issuing stock. They can make their own coin and get and sell those coins in exchange for fiat. And then that's essentially like owning equity in the company to a certain extent uh, based yes. on that. So the difference between, sorry, the difference between the normal coins, because you have probably 5,000, 10,000 cryptocurrencies around. When I sell you my token, I'm not going to give you back the money if you ask. You just buy the token, then you can transact in the market, but you can come back to me and say, hey, give me 10, my $10,000 10, back. A stable coin is like that. It's a bank getting your money, keeping your money, giving your money back when you want. So that's a very three different, right? Stable coin is the bridge between the fiat world and the crypto world. Exactly. Exactly. Got it. So now let's talk about the digital bond because you said there was a good example of a risk of banks being cut out of the picture, so to speak, or a threat to them. I don't know if that's the right way to, I may be, correct me if I'm phrasing this wrong, but can you explain what is a digital bond? Why is that? A big deal. Yes. So one of, one of the applications of blockchain, beyond the fact that you can create cryptocurrencies, is to apply to, to the tokenization of debt. As a city of Lugano, we issue bonds, right, on the market. Normally, you go to the stock exchange, you ask for 100 million, they give you 100 million, and you write on the paper, I, you know, I have to give you back 100 million in 10 years, okay? And this is the way the bond market happens. Now, many has tried to digitalize these bonds, to tokenize these bonds, to make it more efficient, not to write in a paper or let's say not to, to keep it in a bank. So many companies, many countries try to, to tokenize this. Say, let's do a token and I, I give you the token, you give me the money. That's it. It's very easy. So it's a technology that can make you save money. In Switzerland, we have SDX, a six digital exchange. It's a big project from the Swiss stock exchange, the official six stock exchange X. They put a lot of money to build up a digital platform based on the blockchain. To be honest, it's not a public blockchain, it's a private blockchain. So it's, I think it's in Corda for the ones who knows the blockchains, but it doesn't matter. It's a blockchain, but the technology is there and we are tokenizing bonds there. And SDX is the very first fully regulated digital platform based on the blockchain in the world. They got the license from the FINMA, which is the SSC from Switzerland, the financial regulator, in 20, I think 2019, 2020, probably. And then I issued on this platform the very first bond with has full characteristics as a traditional bond. So is in I think in the world, probably there, there could be another, but I don't think so. I never found another one. This 100 million I issued last year in January last year was the real first full characteristic bonds which means it's transacted on the blockchain, he has secondary market, he's native, digital native, and he will die digital. And then it's recognized by the Swiss National Bank for the report transaction of the financial sector. Here, maybe I'm, I'm speaking a little bit technically, but yeah. it's, it's something very important for a bond. So it's a very, it's a bond, but it's on the blockchain. And now others are coming to, to issue on this platform because, because it's an official platform. And my point on the disintermediation is this, because many call me to present this bond and they ask, well, what was the advantage to do this in the blockchain? I said, nothing. Actually, it took me three months to issue this bond on this blockchain platform with the stock exchange, with the lead manager, which was the Zucker Cantonal Bank, big bank in Switzerland, and Moody's, who was rating the bond. It took us three months of discussion to understand if this bond was really a normal bond and the rating could be the same rating as the traditional bonds because you cannot have two different ratings. So at the end, at the end it was okay and we issued that. And I said, there is no advantage. Actually, I was the first one and it took me three months of my personal time to understand this, but it was fun. It was interesting. It was innovation. It was really innovating this system. I say, so what you did, why you did it? I say, yeah, because we are making story, history here. We are setting up the infrastructure for the future. So in the future, in five, 10 years, I'm expecting the banks to reduce the cost of issuing a bond mm. because 
it's easier, it's less work. You don't have to do much work to do if it's all automatic, right? I can send you the money, I can get, I can get your money and I send you the token of the bond. So they say, there is no reason to do that. Yes, there is a reason because we want to make it more efficient. And the banks has to be in the middle of this process. But the risk is this. Imagine that the, the Swiss National Bank issues a, a central bank digital currency for everybody. So they really tokenize the whole Swiss francs. So I can't spend the Swiss francs on the shops, for instance, right. as you do with Tether, et cetera. If they do that, then I can issue my 100 million to you as a citizen directly. Say, right. do you want to buy my debt? Yes. I send you, well, how much you want? $100, $100,000. I send you the token. You send me immediately the, the, the Swiss francs with a right. smart contract. So I can really cut the banks out on that. Right. And, and the bank realized that. So they are trying to be part of the process anyway. So they will learn for le less for sure. But they have to be the part of the process today because in five years, I can do this directly. I could actually do it today. The technology is already there. Maybe the laws don't allow you, but just change the law and then I can do that. And there's a big advantage on this as a city because if I issue a bond on a stock exchange, 100 million, probably 60, 70 million are bought by three or four big investors, right. insurance, life insurance, et cetera, or treasurer of big companies. And they tell me how much spread they are allowed to, to right. give to me. Because they, they own it all. So they're, yeah, yeah. So they, they buy the big chunk. So if they say, you have to pay me 0, 10% more for the risk, I can say, yeah, I give you only 0, 0, 0, 07, but it's a negotiation. But if I'm issuing 100 million to 1 million people giving me the money, right. then I can set up the price. Because if you're a citizen, you're putting 1,000 1, francs to the city of Lugano, you don't care to earn 0, 10% more or less. You're just buying this for investment for yourself. So I can set up the price. And for me, 0, 10% is 100,000 francs less interest per year on a 10-year bond is 1 million I save. Yeah. So you can use this million to, you know, invest in a street, in yeah. a school, et cetera. So then, it makes sense to go there. So can we, you were touching on a topic, I think that's probably on the, the tip of the tongue of a lot of people here, and it's they're worried about a neo-feudalism. They're worried about the unprecedented control and surveillance that this kind of technology paired with something like AI, which is being determined, the objectives of the AI are being determined by the programmers and the people financing this. So you talk about the big players being able to buy up all your bonds and then dictate the terms. A lot of people, I think, are worried about the neo-feudalism threat of this. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because CBDCs, like you talk about, what value do banks have to offer them? Why even entertain a CBDC if we don't need them? What value are they bringing to the table? Or are we just like letting Kev, and I'm saying this to be frank, because I feel like that's what listeners might be thinking. But we call it the Cousin Jerry rubber stamp. Like, Cousin Jerry's just not very bright, but he's the cousin of the mayor. And I, well, I should, maybe, I don't know if I should say that. But you got to pay to get his rubber stamp because you got to pay his rubber stamp. And you just mentioned now there's laws in place that prevent you from doing some of this stuff. So what value add is a CBDC? Is there one? Or are we just grandfathering in archaic power structures? Yes. I'm working for a public institution. I'm working for a city and I work for a state. Right. So normally, if you work for the government, you should not express this idea that I'm going to tell you, but this is part of Switzerland and the Swiss mentality. I'm just doing this, uh, telling you this before, because maybe it can, some people can say, what are you saying? You are working for a city, you cannot say that. But I think freedom, democracy, the real democracy, which is really rare in the world, it must be preserved. Freedom of people, freedom of financial services has to be preserved. It doesn't mean that we are leading to anarchy. It's really the freedom, right? right? Then there is the respect. There are limits, but freedom is really important. So as Swiss citizens, the Swiss people really care about democracy, really care about freedom. Uh, I don't know if you know, but we are one of the oldest, probably the oldest democracy in the world. And we go to vote for so many things. Swiss people continue to vote on everything. We have a semi-direct democracy. We have the government, et cetera, parliament, and like the US, the Senate, et cetera, they take decisions. But we are, if you are not happy, you just collect some signs and they say, stop, <laughs> you're making something we don't like. So if 100,000 people say, okay, then the whole population goes and say yes or no. 
Mm. Population is not financial expert or they're not military expert, but we vote on buying the F-18 from the US or right. let's say building a new street, etc. So people do this. And this is democracy. People say what they think. Sure, you cannot really vote on everything, but the most important topic we vote. So we really care about democracy. We really care about financial freedom and freedom of the people and privacy. Mm. So Swiss people are really strict on this. It's a very interesting country, very innovative country. Actually, we are on the top of the ranking. We are number one on innovative country. And the second is Sweden. And sometimes many people mix Switzerland and Sweden, two different countries. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, but for many years, we are first, they are second, they are first, we are second. But we are on the top of the innovative countries and also democratic. So why I say this? It's because privacy is very important. So. If the central bank issues a, a, a CBDC, let's say a retail CBDC, which means you can use in the shops everywhere, like the, the cash or like the credit cards, you know, the money on the credit cards, then they can really control everything of you. Yeah. Yeah. Today, we are, today we are controlled by the banks. Right. You have seen that the, the, the Russians started the war in Ukraine. We blocked the accounts around the world. This is probably okay because in certain cases, maybe our limit just because they're Russian, they block the money. It's not correct. There's nothing to do with the world. They're just Russian. So why do you block their money? There should be reason. But if you take, I think Canada, you're from Canada, right? Yep, Canada. If I remember well, then you tell me if I'm mistaking. There was a kind of strike. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just yeah, that... recently at the time of this recording, it was recently by the Supreme Court ruled to be illegal and against our constitution. And people are now calling for Trudeau to step down immediately. Even with the, they say the pathway to the road, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So I think that's part of where you're talking about. We need democracy. We need privacy in that because despite the best of intentions, either someone who's either misguided, misinformed, or just inept, not skilled at what they do, if they're given a tool that's very powerful, they can hurt people. That's why people have to have a driver's license to drive a vehicle. You're flying down the road in a half ton hunk of metal. It's like a flying rock. You can go through houses and demolish groups of school children walking to school. So we do need guardrails in place. So I'm glad you brought this up. So it sounds like, I, again, I ask, what is the benefit of a CBDC then? Why do we need the banks then? Yeah. So what happened in Switzerland is the Swiss National Bank clearly said, today, we are going to use a wholesale CBDC. Wholesale means uh, use among or inside the financial sector, not by the citizens. So basically you, <laughs> using this to transact between banks. But we don't want to issue a retail CBDC, which is, a, let's say, a, a crypto frame that I have in my wallet and I can spend in the shops. Why? Because they say there is a huge concern on privacy. Because if you spend this, we know exactly what you're buying, where and when, and where are you moving, right. et cetera, et cetera. So this is the central bank. Imagine, that's really, I think Switzerland is a very special case. Even the central bank, who has huge interest from the government side to control everything, to control the money, et cetera, they say, no, we are not going to go into this because we have the risk that we ourselves, we are going to use this to control you. Amazing. I don't know if the Federal Reserve is ready to uh, <laughs> say something like that, right? In the US. No, the Federal Reserve would never. Would never. Okay. <laughs> so there, there is a very big concern on CBDCs and privacy in a retail way. In, in the financial sector, we full say there is no problem. It's just a more efficient way to do it. So there is a big, and that's why private private stable coins like USDT or other, they are used a lot in emerging countries to build up the new infrastructure and using this. Sure, you can say, I give my, my information to the private company. Exactly. So Bitcoin is the only one that you can really transact and be really anonymous and be really sure that nobody's checking you. So this is extreme the, the extreme freedom we should find a way in the middle. So I'm positive with the central bank digital currency. It can bring speed in the transactions. Right. Uh, not for Switzerland, because honestly, in Switzerland, we have apps, we have banks, everything is working so efficiently that we really don't need it. We could go ahead with our apps, etc. But if I want to send money to my friend in Guatemala, ha, then I need something to the old traditional banking, then it's a mess. Speaking at a worldwide level, speed ups everything Got and it. then for the emerging countries or the countries where they don't have 
infrastructure, financial infrastructure, it's amazing how you can build it fast because you just need a phone. That's it. So and actually, sorry. And actually, there's one one more point is the unbanked people. There are billions of people unbanked in the world, not in Switzerland, but we have, for instance, five million unbanked people in France. Imagine. So those people, they don't have access to the banking sector, to the banking services. So with a CBDC or, or a crypto or a stablecoin, they can survive in our society. So I think there is a lot of value behind this. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it was Nigeria I heard that the government was trying to get rid of and ban Bitcoin and it just made it more popular. And people even- Even found, China. <laughs> yeah, some service was allowing people to text payments for stuff, which I thought was crazy because you know, the, the cost of transactions. Anyways, is this all, and I'm really stepping outside my knowledge here, but I've heard rumors of something called the QFS, the quantum financial system. Is this- do you know anything of this? Is this tied into that? What's it, its role in this? I think you're talking about quantum cryptography, right? And the impact of quantum computer on all this. I think it's a it's a very big issue. Uh, potentially, a quantum computer can break break uh, the the cryptography of the cryptocurrencies today. I'm not sure Bitcoin, but probably also Bitcoin. The potential of power and calculation is so high. I don't know if they can, but potentially can. Yeah, I think AI is coming up and then states and companies, we try to get the best of these to lead the world. Quantum computer is a second big risk that if it's concentrated in the in few hands and in the worst hands, then it can have an impact on the world. And I bring the example of Swiss National Bank, our national bank who is doing CBDC tests with the digital bonds coming up. They're already working, I think it's public, on quantum cryptography for a CBDC with quantum cryptography. I think they're working with David Chaum, which is a very well-known person in the crypto space, and they're trying to anticipate this. And I remember last year when I issued this bond and I met Thomas Moser, who is alternative board member of the Swiss National Bank, is the person who was in charge of all these projects. And I say, we were talking about quantum cryptography. Say, oh, yeah, Thomas, what do you think? For when is this problem? And he said, it's for now. Yeah. So now. they are already working on this at Swiss National Bank. But this is a big issue. I have not the knowledge to think about this or take, a, take and speak about this. But I feel there is a problem. And I'm sure we will, let's say, the humanity will find a solution for that. So I'm concentrating in developing now what we yeah. have we have at disposal. Great. I love that we broke it down, how people can understand how a stable coin and even how the city has its own stable coin, how these provide layers of protection and privacy, so to speak, even if there is a CBDC banking behind the central banks. You don't have to worry about going to see your doctor telling you that your blood pressure is high or something, so you shouldn't drink. And now you can't use your money to buy alcohol or whatever, that you lose your free will. I think that's a, a big concern. If uh, I can get, if I can give my advice to everybody around the world in each country, yeah. if your central bank is taking up or bringing up a, a project on CBDC, make sure the population will be assured about privacy. Because if you don't take care about this, they will just build it up and, and give it to you. We will just use it, but then you use completely use your privacy. So be very careful on this. Right. Point. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, how do we because this is the next question. A lot of people are concerned that, again, I mentioned our, our debt-based fiat system is, is geopolitically, economically, the world is teetering. I'm optimistic long-term. I think we've got some bumpy bumps in the road ahead of us. And so I guess from your standpoint, if someone's concerned about the collapsing of a currency or the changing of the reserve currency or anything like that, as someone who's worked in traditional banking and fintech and understands the needs of a business to be highly liquid, but also, I'm just going to leave it at that. Do you have any advice for how do you navigate into this new world? How do you proceed? How do you know what to keep your funds in? Like, how do you navigate? You just hope, oh, I'm from this country and I just hope our money. Look at what happened to Venezuela. If you could go back in time, let's say Venezuela was about to happen now, what would you be your advice to those citizens of Venezuela? It's very difficult. Also, also Argentina, it's it's a big problem around the world. Uh, to me, it's clear that the traditional financial system is dead. 
right. really dead. And that seems many years. We are just feeding the passion and t- keeping the passion going on, but it's really dead. I- I'm linking to a, one information or one point, which is the public debt around the world. If you take a look to the United States, Europe, but also my city or my canton or Switzerland in general, etc., you know, or Italy, France, it's just impossible to go on like this. We are just making debts and debts and debts. I think the United States is 33,000 billion. It's not right? mathematically, they can't even keep up with the interest payments. Yeah. And and Italy is 3,000, almost 3,000 billions. I remember yeah, probably 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I was watching the, the balance sheet of Italy. It was only 1,900 billion and they had 80 billion in interest to pay every year. So it's just... You cannot sustain this anymore. They are just, and how they, and how they feed this, they just print money. They right. print money, the central bank, uh, European central bank, they print money, the US, they print money. Then the financial crisis come up and the Federal Reserve prints thousands and thousands of billions to save the banks, etc. This is just no more possible. Yeah. It will, at some point, everything will fall down. Right. And I don't want to be negative, but if you take the signs around the world, what yeah. happens when you have this kind of collapse? You have war. And right. now we have Israel, we have yeah, Ukraine, yeah. we have many yes. countries coming up. So I am really hope it won't happen, but this is the past that in the past we had. It's exactly the same. So this system has to end somewhere. And with this system has to end some, uh, some type of government, some type of countries, they have to change completely. Switzerland could be a model, but even in Switzerland, we have a lot of problems starting, but still we are on the top. So we are lucky, but still we are going down. During the pandemic, we have seen all the governments, including Switzerland, and I'm not making any critics on this because the pandemic was very bad for everywhere. But even in our democracy, we start pushing some rule some rules to the population. You cannot go to the restaurant. You cannot do that and that. And I think they went really far away behind the limits that democracy gives. And I was really, for the first time, I was really shocked that in Switzerland, we could do these kind of things. Even though it was kind of suggestion, you, you should not go. But right. if you go, you can have problems. But I don't tell you which problem. You're going to kill so, grandma. Yeah. And this is Switzerland. Imagine other countries. I think the population had to start kind of revolution. I'm not t- saying... Uh, uh, you know, not yeah. harm revolution, not violent revolution, but change the mentality and block these kind of models of states. It's old. It's gone. We have to change fast because AI is coming and AI will dis- disrupt everything. Uh, and blockchain is disrupting. Crypto is dis- disrupting. Uh, Bitcoin is disrupting. Quantum computing is disrupting. So all these revolution at the same time, it can be too much for these systems to resist and they don't have to fall at once. We have to change gradually. Otherwise, it's a catastrophic situation for the economy, for the people, for your money. But definitely, if you keep your US dollar, et cetera, they can devalue it in five minutes. They just right. print money and that's it. That right. is Bitcoin in the other side. Right. Got it. Got I'm, it. I'm, to- I'm talking like a maximalist right now. <laughs> right. No, no. So, but I think, like you said, we need it all. We need it all because we need paved roads. We need garbage pickup. We need... School, so where, like you talk about, it's almost like, it, it sounds like a portfolio. It sounds like a portfolio yeah. approach where you don't want to have all your assets in one or the other. And you also have to start thinking in terms of, what do they call it? But ve- like real, I think that's part of what the supply chain issues. They said there were a lot of supply chain issues, but I know people in the know for some things. And they were saying some of these supply chain issues were really because during the pandemic, so many countries printed, Canada, you brought up Canada. Canada printed 50 years of their annual budget in 2020 alone. It's just amazing. So now now Canada wants to buy some whatever. I'm in the Philippines. They want to buy some mangoes. And they go, hey, Philippines, ship us a bunch of mangoes. And they go, okay, what are you going to use to pay for them? We're going to pay Canadian dollars. And they're like, "Uh, I don't want those Canadian dollars. (laughs) It's worth. And so that's what the real supply chain issues were. To certain, in some ways, was everybody having these arguments about what's the real value of what? And you can yeah. see the, the M2 chart, the money supply, a lot of bills, a lot of serial numbers being taken off ledger to try to thin that out. Where do you see things being in five, 10 years from now? What do you mean? Can you say it again? If what's your, if you have a crystal ball and yeah. you look five, 10 years down the road, what a, a, a citizen of planet Earth's financial life look like? I think, first of all, we will have new form of states. 
what we have today is not going to work for, for well, maybe 10 years, 20 years, I don't know, but it's going to fall at one point. Also because generally speaking in the world, in the public administrations, there is a huge waste of money, completely, not completely inefficient, but most of them very inefficient, most of sector, completely waste of money. So that's why we, we accumulate debt and this has to change and stop. So we need a new form of state. Uh, but we have countries, right? We have boundaries, we have countries. It's difficult to see. But technology and AI is disrupting the borders, right? And cryptocurrencies is disrupting the borders. So I'm very curious what's going to happen. I think there will be revolution, once again, a Pacific <laughs> revolution, <laughs> that not violent revolution, and new form of collaboration in the world will show up. I'm certainly sure. I cannot tell you which one. Right. But I'm sure we will change. Probably stay, we still survive, but we have to reduce their importance and their spending and move the resources to a more direct uh, involvement of the citizenships that they can really profit of what they need. Because sometimes they, they do services that the citizens don't need. And right. they just forget that people, sometimes they need schools, they need just to eat school and job. Right. And that's it. We have a good life with this. And they're not the priorities sometimes of the states, right? So we have to reorientate the, demo the, the general democracy idea in the world. So I feel like we will have new collaborations, not between states, but maybe between populations. Yeah, yeah. And migration, migration is a sign of this. Yeah. The migration is just amazing. South from US, south from Europe, and Asia, it's a big mess, right? Yeah. So yeah. this mix is already mixing population in a very strong way. We just have to manage this and profit from this, not creating a, not that this is a problem. We have to so take the value of mixing us. Yeah. I, I, but I cannot tell you which model. I really difficult to say. That's okay. I love that. I felt so good in the middle to hear you talk about freedom, democracy, and privacy. I'm very grateful that there are stewards like you involved in this. I think a lot of people lost faith in institutions they had trusted their whole life. And I think it's more, so important that we do walk carefully into the future. And I'm very grateful for people like you taking care of some of these things that and pushing the envelope and pushing that future towards a new golden age for humanity. I think that's I think that's really right. fantastic. Thank you. I really appreciate it. People want to learn more. If they want to get in touch, what do you recommend? What are the best ways for them to, to contact, to reach out? It's very easy. You, they can reach me in LinkedIn. It's really the only one social media I, I use, mm -hmm. and I use a lot. And people are contacting me via LinkedIn. So you can find me easy. Paolo Bortolin is very easy. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. So those that want to reach out, you can look them up on LinkedIn. P-A-O-L-O-B-O-R-T-O-L-I-N. Paolo Bortolin. Right? That's Portolin, right? Exactly. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> We've got the right guy if he's got the MBA and he's in Lugano, Switzerland. Paolo, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us, knowing you have your own followers, your own family, your own direct reports. You're waiting on some good news. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with my audience and I so we can all better understand and walk together into a brighter future. Thank you to you for the invitation. It was very great to talk to you.